Good morning again, everybody. Let's go ahead, and we're not even going to make you stand. We're just going to let you sit there in your easy, stair, easy chair recliner. And since we don't have recliners here, and I can see everybody there drinking their coffee in their flannel pajamas with donuts, I better stop. I'm making myself hungry. It's two cups of flannel pajamas. <laughs> and so let's start off. I wanted to sing songs that talked about happiness and how happy we can be. So we're going to start off with the song, Happy Am I. Now, I know you can see me. I can't see you. But I'm going to assume that each and every one of you have a smile on your face right now. I like Alma. She's already doing the calisthenics. She's going like this. <laughs> of us here look happy most of that's because i can't see past the communion table all right now i'm gonna ask ken to come and pray but i'm gonna ask him to do it after the next song <laughs> because he's a little bit older than me and the 15 yard dash takes a toll on you for the rest of the service and so i don't want to see ken fall asleep after he makes the 15 yard dash up here so after the next song We'll have Ken come up and lead us in prayer. In my heart there rings a melody. I want to hear that melody loud and clear now. I have a song that Jesus gave me. It was sent from heaven above. There never was a sweeter melody. Tis a melody. to finish that 10-yard dash and come up and lead us in prayer. That's uphill both ways. 
Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you we can come together and, and uh, worship you today, Lord. Lord, we want to honor you today, Lord. We just thank you that you're a God who cares. Lord, this day of Memorial Day, we think of the veterans who have given their all, Lord, and the sacrifice that we might have the freedoms that we have. Lord, we praise you for that. And, and Lord, I just pray that each one of us today, Lord, purpose in our heart that, Lord, we'll think of what it costs for us to have the freedom that we have. Lord, I just pray for next week's opening, Lord, at the hearts of the people. And we'll all rejoice together in one building, Lord, and, and a family together, Lord, worshiping you. You bless it, Lord, even with all the, the obstacles that we have to overcome, Lord, but we'll be together. Just bless this, Lord, bless this church, we pray, Lord, and use it in a mighty way to be a lighthouse throughout this state, the county, of the world, Lord. And I just pray right now, Lord, that you be with Pastor and give him strength, Lord, and wisdom and the clarity of thought and mind, words, Lord, that he'll preach your word. Uh, just stir our hearts, Lord. Just you be glorified again. We just thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Ken. Appreciate that. Well, let me get through a few announcements. Again, we cover most of these in Sunday school, but in case you're just joining us, I want to make sure I thank each and every one of you that have sent cards and notes and letters in and all the encouragement. I appreciate that so very, very much. And just as Ken said, looking so forward to next week to be able, all of us, to meet here. And again, if you're on Facebook, uh, please make sure you look at the procedures that are in place when we do meet back. And then once you read that, please hit like or with the hearts or whatever those things are. And so I can look and see who have, has seen the information and read it. And because those who haven't, I'll have to make special trips or try to use the mail to get all the procedures out. Now, for those of you who have read the procedures, those definitely are not my guidelines and not my procedures. I don't know if I've wore a mask yet. I think maybe once, but um, these are procedures that we've gotten, as I said, from uh, the Facebook post from David Gibbs, from uh, Pastor Paul Chapel, and the people that he's able to get in contact with, Brad Dacus from the Pacific Justice League, and then many other state legislators and senators. And so we're trying to follow their guidelines. And remember I mentioned that I wasn't going to put those guidelines up until a week before because things change so quickly. And so after we posted the guidelines, here comes the CDC comes out and they said, you know, by touching things, you really can't get the virus that easily. <laughs> I knew it. I knew we were going to buy that hydrostatic sprayer so we can spray everything so when you touch it, it's free from disease. We're still going to use it anyway just to make us confident, but um, <laughs> there'll be many... Well, several changes that are taking place, and some of them are still in the works, but the biggest thing is we're so excited to be able to meet back again. And um, just according to the guidelines that I've been following online and several hundred, if not thousand, other pastors, uh, the opening phases will be on Sunday, <clears throat> Sunday mornings when it will all be sterilized inside here. And the service, service will probably last about 45 minutes to an hour. And again, this is under the guidelines that we're getting from the different Christian law associations and pastors that have influence of people in the know. And so again, these aren't necessarily what I would like to do, but I'm trying to take the advice of, of people that are in the influence with people that do know. Again, we probably won't agree with m many of them, um, but we're going to follow those. Many of you might have heard about the church in Mississippi that was had a court case, I think it was against the governor, if I remember right, because they met on Easter and they were shut down, even though in Mississippi the churches were considered essential. Well, an arsonist burnt down the building, and somewhere there on the property it was written about, this will keep you home, you bunch of hypocrites. And so we're trying to do everything that's within our power and even go beyond what the CDC is recommending, uh, just to do due diligence and trying to keep a good testimony and a good example to the unsaved world, as well as making sure that all of our seniors that may have some health concerns, that if they want to come during this time, they will feel free to do so. And so if you can just please click like after you read that, and then I'll know who I need to contact this week uh, to let others know that we are opening. Uh, keep in your prayers, uh, Justin Iraqi and Rochelle's family, especially your mom, Rose, and or sisters and brothers and aunts that I 
had an opportunity to be able to meet to the last uh, week or so. Uh, they did have a memorial there at the house um, for Rochelle yesterday, and so we need to keep them in your prayer. It's very difficult as time goes on from that point. You know, people forget, but people that lost, they don't forget for a long, long time, and, and so the hardest days are still around the corner, uh, so keep that in mind um, and be in prayer for them. Again, the people who have been ill and afflicted, there's many that are going through tests, and I don't want to mention all of the, the tests that people are going through at this time, but uh, Hal Nolan, again, has asked for us to continue to be in prayer for him. Uh, he had hoped that the chemo treatments would be done, but yet he's still undergoing chemo treatments, and it has taken away all of his appetite. It's taken away all of his strength, and so we just want to lift him up in prayer. And then also Melissa Standen with the cancer that she's fighting and the different treatments that she'll be, be under. Uh, keep her in your prayers also and such an encouragement. I know that she's constantly making, or whatever they call, making posts or putting posts or whatever the right term is and just praising God even in, in spite of the difficulties as well as all the rest of you that are going through uh, different challenges and appointments and different tests. We want to keep you in our prayers also. Um, so please keep that in mind. But we're going to get into our birthdays now. And I'm so happy. Travis called me yesterday. I didn't even recognize him as being Travis. I thought he was one of these financial people that wanted me to, you know, refinance my house again. I was just about to hang up because I didn't recognize him. And said, oh, it's Travis. I almost want to say, you're not in real estate, are you? But he called me and said, you know, it's going to be Lee's birthday tomorrow. Do you think it'd be okay if we came to church? Except for the first two weeks, I've never told anybody they can't come. And so I know what they say, but who am I to say no? <laughs> so I said, absolutely, absolutely. And so Lee Cogburn, is it today? It's actually today. She is 81 years old today. Now, that deserves a big hand of applause. Just don't spill your coffee at home while you clap. And I always like to talk about our age and delectic models, so you actually be 18. Isn't that exciting? No, that's not exciting. I'm not going back to that time at all. That's a scary time. But happy birthday to Lee. And then also, Nell Gorman. It's her birthday this week, so happy birthday, Nell. Appreciate you and your ministry. Look forward to you coming back. And also, Ray Foster's birthday is this week, so happy birthday, Ray. I hope you have a great birthday time, and I know Phyllis spoils your rotten already, so you have a birthday every day, so man, you're really going to be up there in years having a birthday every day. But happy birthday, Ray, and I hope that your day is very, very special. All right, let's go ahead and we'll sing happy birthday to these three all together now. A happy birthday to you, a happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. And a very happy birthday to all of you. And looking right here at Lee, dressed all in red and shining. And boy, I tell you what, that's a beautiful dress. Beautiful dress. And anniversaries. Do we have anniversaries that are coming up this week? Lonnie and Donna Watts. Is it like 42 years, 41 years? 40, 40 years today, four decades. Doesn't that just sound a lot longer when you say four decades? Four tenths of a century. <laughs> well, congratulations, Alani and Donna. Then also Steve and Darla Jean Moore, 32 years. And so congratulations to Steve and, and Darla. Can't wait to see them also back in services when they can make it back. So happy anniversary to you two. And I hope Steve is there watching. You know, now that it's Sunday and he's there at home. And uh, Darla, make sure you give him a bad time <clears throat> for all of us here. Let's sing happy anniversary of the Wasses and the Moors this morning. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary, God bless you. Happy anniversary to you. 
All right, well, let's go ahead and we'll sing one more song, another joy-filled song, since Jesus came into my heart. I hope you remember that day, that day filled with joy and gladness. What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. I have light in my soul for which long I have sought since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Pleasant joy for my soul, like the sea billows roll. Since Jesus came into my heart. I have seen since Jesus came into my heart And my sins, which were many, are all washed away Since Jesus came into my heart Since Jesus came into my heart Since Jesus came into my heart Let the joy hold my soul like the sea billows roll Since Jesus came into my heart I shall go there to dwell in that sea unknown Since Jesus came into my heart And I'm happy, so happy as on would I go Since Jesus came into my heart Like the sea billows roll Since Jesus came into my heart Man, my shoulder really hurts now. Thank you for that great scene. <laughs> uh, thank you, Sharon. Thank you, Carol. Appreciate that so very, very much. Well, it's good to see you all here this morning, all those that are watching online. And so I trust that God will speak to our hearts through his word today. So if you will, let's go ahead and get right into our message against the continuation from last week. And then we'll continue it again next Sunday. We'll be in Psalm chapter 118 and verse 22 through 23. <clears throat> Psalm 118, verse 22 and verse 23. And so we have started a short little series about dangerous freedom or the safety of servitude. We talked last week in introductory about the pilgrims, about the signers of the Declaration, about the Revolutionary War, that all of America history and society has always believed in a dangerous freedom. And we've always practiced that belief that in our democracy, in our form of government, has been founded upon the freedom that we have in Jesus Christ, and that every person has the right to worship God according to that freedom of choice, the dictates of his heart, and the command of God's scripture. I am so thankful for Roger Williams, a Baptist preacher several hundred years ago, that pushed for the truth that America would simply be a Christian nation but would not be a nation of one denomination. That it would be a nation where people could worship Jesus Christ according to the word of God and the dictates of that person's heart under God and under the word of God. So we're not like England with the Church of England or other countries that would be Christian in the Protestant terms and, and yet their people were not free to worship God as they wished. They had to worship according to to the dictates of a state religion. But America has always been different. From 1620, in the times of the pilgrims and arriving there on Plymouth Rock, 
until 400 years today, we have always practiced a dangerous freedom. Life simply is dangerous. We live under a curse and a fallen world. And each of us, Scripture tells us, have an appointment with death. It is appointed once to man to die, and after this, the judgment. And that's not a threat to the child of God. That's like crossing the finish line and standing on the victory platform to receive the crown. But life has always been dangerous. And life in most of the world, under the governments of those that do not believe in Christ, mostly communists and dictatorships, would always say that Christianity is not essential. Not only is it not essential, but in some countries it was a death penalty. And even in much of the Muslim, Muslim world today, to acknowledge Christ as your Savior is a very dangerous thing to do. It will cost you your life. And as I've said over the century since Stephen, that we found Christian martyrs make up about 70 million people. And we still subscribe to a magazine today that's called The Voice of the Martyrs that was written by Richard Wormbrandt, a man that laid down his life for the belief of freedom. It was a very dangerous freedom. So Psalm 118, verse 22, I want you to notice, even the Word of God declares a thousand years before Christ, before the church, that Christianity is always going to be something that the political powers and powers that be are going to reject and attempt to set aside and tell us that the church and Jesus Christ are not essential and they're not even necessary. The stone which the builders refused is become the headstone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. I want to encourage us in the day that we live in that we have been told by many of the powers that be that the churches of Jesus Christ are not essential. And that is not a new doctrine. That is a doctrine that is at least 3,000 years old. That Jesus Christ even said of himself that he is the cornerstone of the church as well as the millennial period, as well as heaven and as well as all civilizations that have built their country on Christian principles, Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone, or in verse 22, he is the headstone. Again, the headstone, when they built with rock and mortar, the headstone or the cornerstone, the chief cornerstone, was the first stone of the foundation that was set in place. Then the whole rest of the foundation was measured and put in line and was made square according with the chief cornerstone. Every brick, every stone, every block had to be put in center with the chief cornerstone. But Jesus said even of himself that the builders would refuse him as being the chief cornerstone that they would build without Jesus Christ as the chief cornerstone. And therefore, hundreds if not thousands of civilizations have come to power, have risen to power, has risen to prov um, um, been promoted, only to find that there comes a time when they collapse in upon themselves. Because without Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone of the foundation, no matter what you build upon is only going to collapse. And so in the America that we live today, we have been founded with Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. And for the first couple hundred years plus of our American history, the experience and the experiment of freedom, Jesus Christ has been that cornerstone. In the last several decades, we have found out that the builders of American society and the atheists and those that believe in, in humanism have come to um, prominence and they're telling us that Jesus Christ and the church is not needed. That not only is Jesus not the chief cornerstone, he is just a myth. He is just the product of weak people's imagination. That there is no God and that humanistic atheism is the religion of the day. And today, as we said last week, 
their entire political parties in America that now call themselves the party of no God. And if that party tries to tear out Jesus Christ as the chief cornerstone, it tries to make America believe that Christ in the church is not essential, America will not stand any longer when that chief cornerstone is removed. We're seeing that happen today. It's not new. It's 3,000 years old. But I love what verse 23 says. This is the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in our eyes. What's marvelous? That he's becoming the headstone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in our eyes. There's coming a day after the rapture, and seven years after that in the tribulation ends, that Jesus Christ is going to return with what the Democratic Party calls the non-essential Jesus Christ. He's going to be returning on a white steed. He's going to be returning in righteousness and justice and judgment. He's going to destroy the non-essential humans that declare Jesus Christ does not exist. And they are going to be wedded by the sword of his justice and his righteousness. And with each piercing word of his tongue, that sword of righteousness... The confession's going to come from their mouth. Uh-oh, we were wrong. It's marvelous in our eyes. It's around the corner. Jesus Christ is going to become that chief cornerstone. We'll rule and reign with him on earth for a thousand years. And then for the eons of time, unending, we'll enjoy the presence of of the chief cornerstone, Jesus Christ. The party of no God, hypocrisy, those that do not know Christ, they are the ones that will be non-essential. God, through heaven, there's coming a time where he's going to wipe every tear from our eyes, and what those tears are, there's many opinions, but I believe maybe some of those tears are the remembrance of those that we love that refuse Jesus Christ as the cornerstone, built their life on their own wisdom and own knowledge, and found themselves at the white throne of judgment, and then bound and cast in lake of fire forever and ever and ever. You see, God's going to become, Christ is going to become the chief cornerstone. Those in positions of power and ignorance and Denying God's existence will never be remembered ever again. I don't know how you become less significant or more non-essential than to be cast out of God's sight forever and ever and ever into a place of eternal darkness and fire and pain and never be in the presence of God Almighty once again. So it's marvelous in God's eyes what's happening it looks like things are falling apart, but as I've said many times, if you read the Bible, when things are falling apart, they're always falling into place. It'll be the only time of destruction where that description is going to give way to something that is very wonderful and marvelous and beautiful, the millennial period of Jesus Christ. So again, world governments have always attempted to minimize the significance of the Lord Jesus Christ as well as the significance of his church, and they always will do so. To be deemed as non-essential is the ever-increasing opinion of the world in which we live. That's a time to get excited, because Jesus is about to become the chief cornerstone. If we go to the next slide, I want to notice some quotes from famous atheists, some of them Joseph Stalin and Karl Marx and Martin Bormann. These were people in their country who killed millions because they do not believe that people are significant, that they're just product of chance, that they're not designed according to God, that there is no God. Here's what Joseph Stalin said about the non-essentialness of Jesus Christ and obviously also the church. Here's what he says on the screen. God, he asks a question, God is on your side? Is he? Is he God? Is he a conservative? Then he says this, The devil's on my side, and he's a good communist. 
If what he says is true, then good communists all end up in the lake of fire. If what he says is true. The devil's on my side. He's a good communist. Millions of people died during his reign of terror. And then again, a next quote is up from Joseph Stalin again. He said, America is like a healthy body, and its resistance is threefold. And they are patriotism, morality, and its spiritual life. If we can undermine these three things, America will collapse from within. I didn't know the devil had his prophets. But we see exactly what's happening is according to what he actually said. Will collapse from within. Isn't it interesting, the Roman powers, the power of Rome, it never was defeated from the outside. It collapsed from the inside because of its debauchery, immorality, wickedness. And it just ceased to exist. In America, by trying to remove the chief cornerstone, the devil knows if that can happen, America will collapse from within under the weight of its sin and immorality. It'll collapse within upon itself. And Karl Marx, all of us have heard of him. This comes from a lengthier quote. But it is said of Karl Marx that he said this, religion is the opium of the people. Religion is just a drug that we Christians use in order to feel better about themselves. The Christians are just drug addicts that they can't handle the pressures in the affairs of this life. And so they take Jesus Christ as a drug addict would take opium. So religion is the opium of the people. Another communist socialist named Martin Borman, he said this, National socialism and Christianity are irreconcilable. They are irreconcilable. One of them has to fall in the face of the other. And I think we know who wins. And then, lastly, a man named Richard Wormbrandt, who wrote the book Tortured for Christ. And he has a magazine that his organization still puts out, The Voice of the Martyrs. And each month there are stories of those who have given their life for Jesus Christ rather than to deny the chief cornerstone. Here is what he has said. He said, a communist officer told a Christian that he was beating. I am almighty, as you suppose your God can be. He said, I can kill you. Next slide. The Christian answered, The power is all on my side. I can love you while you are torturing me to death. That's where the real power is, according to this Christian who died for his faith. The power is that I'm loving you while you're torturing me to death. So the world has always questioned the authority of God. The world has always questioned creation. As we saw last week, that when the religious leaders brought Jesus Christ before their presence. We said in the last chapter of John, or the last two chapters of John, it tells us if everything that Jesus Christ had accomplished, if all the miracles could be written in the book, there would not be enough books on the planet to contain everything that he did. Now here's what's concerning to religious leaders of Jesus' day who were the political powers under the Roman authorities in Jerusalem. They could care less about the miracles. They could care less about the untold thousands of people that met Christ as Savior, who were raised from the dead, the lame that could walk, the blind that could see, the deaf that could hear, the mute that were able to talk, the lepers that were cleansed, the paralytics that now walk. Thousands. And yet when they ask Jesus Christ, when they bring him before the temple, here's what the political leaders have to say. By what authority dost thou these things? Who gave you this authority? In other words, here's what they're saying. How dare you try to outrank us? How dare you try to get people to follow after you? 
How dare you raise Lazarus from the dead? We're going to kill him too. That's what they said. You see, political powers outside Jesus Christ do not care about the people that they reign over. Don't be fooled by a party that says there's no God. They cannot care about people. They cannot care about you. And the political leaders of Jesus' day crucified Jesus Christ because he dared to take their authority away from them. But he said, my authority is not of this world. I'm a king, as you say, but the people that follow me are not of this world, but my kingdom is coming. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all would quote from Psalm chapter 118. They all would say that Jesus Christ, who has been refused, he's becoming the cornerstone. And that cornerstone is always, always, always rejected. The reason it's rejected is because people are drunk with power. People that are elected by the people, for the people, by the will of the people, get it in their head that they are the power to be. That the Constitution comes second to what they tell us to do and tell us to believe. That the Bible is non-essential. And there comes a time where we have to say, as Peter and John said, we ought to obey God rather than men. Dangerous, or freedom, has always been dangerous. And a dangerous freedom is always better than the safety of servitude. Socialism, communism says, we are your God. You worship us, and we'll keep you safe as long as you serve us. Dangerous freedom says, I'm going to follow the word of God. If what government officials command us to do rejects the principles and the authorities of God's word, then we have to obey God rather than men. So I want us to turn to Acts chapter 4 as we get in the body of the message. I want us to notice the positions of power. The positions of power. And we'll be in Acts 4 in just a moment. So as we look at the next slide, so we talk about these positions of power. In Acts chapter 4 and 5, we're going to see four tactics that are designed to silence the church. This is nothing new. It started shortly after the day of Pentecost, if not on the day of Pentecost, which is the empowering of the church, not the beginning of the church. It is the empowering of the church we'll find four tactics that godless leaders try to put into place in order to silence the church. Not only does the word of God tell us the word to obey God more than man when man's laws contradict God's laws, but the first statement in the Bill of Rights says this, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. We have the power of the word of God, the authority of the word of God, and then we have the authority of our forefathers that lived a dangerous freedom and died for what they believed so that we could enjoy this freedom. When a political leader is sworn into honor, unto office, he swears under an oath and used to be on the word of God that he would stand for the Constitution and uphold the Constitution of the United States. That's their vow, that's their promise. When they cease to do that, they are illegitimate in their political power because they have violated their vows of office. So Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. And so Acts chapter 4 Verses 1 through 4, as we look at the first tactic of godless authority. And as they spake in the temple, it's Peter and John, in chapter 3, they've healed a lame man. And all of Jerusalem's in an uproar because this man's been lame since he's been born, and now he is leaping and jumping and praising God, and all the people are amazed, and boy, the powers that be, they are upset. How dare you use that authority that Jesus Christ had that we killed. You're illegitimate. 
Quit healing people. Quit making people's lives easier. Quit giving them freedom over diseases. Welcome to America. You thought I was talking about Jerusalem. Chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. And as they spake unto the people, the priest and the captains of the temple, the Sadducees came upon them. Interesting. A miracle has been done. And the political leaders and the political policemen of the day, they come upon them. In other words, they're willing to take them by force because they're superseding the authority of the day by the miraculous works of Christ. Verse 2, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. What a crime that is, isn't it? They preached Jesus in the resurrection from the dead and they laid hands on them and put them in hold unto the next day. For it was now eventide, albeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about 5,000. What I see a principle here is when we obey God rather than man, there's a great harvest that takes place. 4,000 people believed, or 5,000 people heard the word, they believed. Sometimes when you take God's men, Peter and John, and you come in and by force you lay hands upon them and you put them into jail for the rest of the night, when lost people see that godly people will take a stand for what they believe and they will not be threatened to proclaim what the Word of God says, it's going to impact lost man, not to make them follow the powers that are against God, but it makes them repent and want to follow Jesus Christ because the preachers of that day were willing to take a stand even when it was imprisonment 5,000 people accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior so the first tactic that they use to silence the church is intimidation this is 2,000 years ago but it's happening today isn't it they're trying to silence the power of the church that's an exciting time Because when that happened 2,000 years ago, thousands of people came to faith in Jesus Christ. Because people want to see a Christianity that is alive and vibrant and is fearless in the face of opposition and will say, thus saith the Lord God. And we will follow what the Lord God says and we will obey God rather than man when man's laws try to violate God's law. The first tactic we're going to use intimidation in the verses we just read it says they came upon them as they preached to the people they came upon them look verse one and as they spake peter and john as they spake in the people the priests and the captains of the temple the sadducees came upon them being grieved that they taught the people and preached through jesus the resurrection of the dead you know in their mind And they see 5,000 plus people there listening to Peter and John. And here's what they think. That's nothing. We'll bring the political police upon you. We'll bring the officers of the guard. We'll bring the Roman centurions, and they'll come with their shields and their battle gear and their swords, and we're going to intimidate you out of existence. (laughs) They came upon them as they preached to the people in a show of force. If it ever becomes illegal to be a Christian, if it ever becomes illegal to practice our faith and fellowship in the church of God, that's a time that will impact the world that we live in if we can stand fast in humbleness and mercy and kindness and meekness and say, Sirs, you have a job to do, and I understand We have a greater job that we must do. So you have to do what you will, but we cannot help but preach the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. We are being set up for a time of great harvest because we're living in a time of intimidation. Verse number two, the powers that be, they are grieved. What does that mean? It means they're putting on a fierce countenance. 
means they're coming with them with an angry look on their face and their fists are clutched and they're grieved. And their countenance is going to show that grief. What are they saying? We're going to intimidate you with our power. I'm going to show you my teeth. We're going to growl. We're going to walk like this. Look like gorillas that we really are. Because we're going to intimidate you into fear and silence. But the only way they could do that to keep them from stop from preaching to the thousands that were there was to take them by force, to put them in the prison and until the next day. There was the threats that they were under. In chapter 4, look at verses 17 through 21. So there's the in, intimidation by their countenance being grieved. And the verses 17 through 21, they try to intimidate through their threats. But that it spread no further among the people. These are the political powers. Let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. In other words, we are the authority and we are commanding you to shut up. To put it bluntly. We never want to hear you preach about that resurrection again. Now, it's not a law on the books, but it's a suggestion of the political power. Sound familiar today? These aren't laws, but we're still going to arrest you. These aren't laws, but well, we're still going to fine you. <laughs> we're going to threaten you that you don't speak in this name anymore. Verse 21. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people, for all men glorified God for that which was done. See, when they tried to tell them they were non-essential, it only made them more essential. It made everybody praise the Lord. It made all the people glorify God for that which was done. Notice verse 21, it says, all men glorified God for that which was done. Bring it on, political powers that be. Bar the church, chain the doors, give us our suggestions that we're not smart enough to be able to protect ourselves in a world of a dangerous freedom. Does it mean that people aren't going to get sick? No. But such has been American life from its existence. It's always dangerous to be free and to be self-governed, and it always will be. They will try to intimidate you. So they threatened them. Verse number 17, they straightly threatened them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. The idea of threatening them means they were filled with indignation. They were angry. They were mad. They were full of wrath. Why? Because somebody that did not have the position of power had more power than they did. That's what the world's afraid of. That's what the democracy of no God is afraid of because Christians are known throughout history. They don't have the position of power. They don't live in the ivory palaces of power. But just by the fact that the Spirit of God lives within, within them, they have the position of power even when they do not have the place of power. And it scares them to death. And so they're filled with indignation. Acts chapter 5, verse number 17 it says, Then the high priest rose up, and all they that were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with indignation. Why are they mad? Because there's 5,000 new converts that are following someone that has no power, but sure has the prestige of the power in Jesus Christ. There's intimidation. You see it today. Pastors that have been put in jail, pastors that have been fined, attendees of churches that have been fined. And thank God for our, our president, who again this week declared that the church is essential. Christians across America need to wake up. The most important thing that political powers can do for you is not give you a paycheck. Not to provide for all your physical needs. The most important thing that a government can do for you is to give you personal freedom even if that freedom is dangerous. You see, the problem with intimidation, they didn't like it because someone else that didn't have the position of power had the presence and the prestige of the power, and the multitudes were following them and not the political powers of the day. The next slide, Acts 4, 
verses 6 through 7. Well, intimidation didn't work, and guess what? It won't work today either. And so in Acts 4, verses 6 through 7, then they go to try to interfere with the process of the church. The next tactic is by interfering. Verse 6 and 7, Acts chapter 4. And Annas the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest, were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them, Peter and John, in the midst, they asked, By what power or by what name have you done this? Again, what are the political powers saying? We don't care about that lame man that couldn't walk since birth. We don't care about those 5,000 people that believe what you're preaching. You don't have the right to do this. You don't have the right to speak in his name. This Jesus, we put him to death. We killed him. But they also know that he rose from the dead, though they won't admit it. Why else would they pay a centurions of soldiers that could amount to 72 people a great sum of money to lie that the disciples stole the body? They knew that wasn't true. So they had to believe that there's a resurrection. But even a resurrected God's not taking my position of power from me. I'll fight him tooth and nail. <laughs> and so they interfere. So they set Peter and John in the midst. And they say, by what power or by what name have you done this? You see, that's the whole problem with American politicians, politicians across the world. They're more interested in the position of their power than they are in the prosperity of their people. That's what they're interested in. It's always been that, that way. Peter and John, you don't have the power to do this. Really? Uh, where's your 5,000 followers? I don't see any of them. <laughs> and so they try to interfere. They're trying to say, we have the power and you're powerless, except there's 5,000 people around disagreeing. They're saying the leaders of the day, we have the reputation and you're just ignorant and unlearned men. Isn't it interesting that ignorant and unlearned men can turn the world upside down and the positions of prestige and power only pollute everything that they touch when they're the position of no God. They're saying you need our permission to speak. You need our permission to teach. When Bunyan was a pastor... The powers that be said, you need a license to be able to preach. And most people wouldn't bought the license, and they had no power at that moment. But the power to license is the power to control. And people with any biblical sense will understand that, and they will refuse a license to do what God has commanded them to do. He spent seven years in jail and wrote the book Pilgrim's Progress, which every Christian should read. And so they try to interfere we don't want you to speak anymore in that name. You're not to teach anymore in that name. And then look at Acts chapter 5, verses 27 through 28. Now they're interfering, and they're bringing them before the courts of the day. They're bringing them to the judges, to those that decide the justice of the day. Acts 5, verse 27 and 28. And when they had brought them... They set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, Did not we straightly command you that you should not teach in this name? And behold, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. If you don't listen to us, we're going to take you to court. No, I'm talking about today. <laughs> if you don't follow the positions of power that deny the essentialness of God in his church, we're going to take you before the judges. And we'll bring your cases before the judges that do not believe in God and have no sympathy to you. You see, we have a higher judge, don't we? The Lord Jesus Christ. And in an application, I am glad that we have a higher judge, so to speak, the President of the United States that says, Go ahead, you godless party. Bring all your accusations against the church. He says the church is essential. I'm glad for our attorney general, Mr. Barr, who already wrote a letter to our governor saying, you are treating the churches unfairly, unjustly, and against the Constitution of America, and you must cease, cease and desist. <laughs> uh, they did the same thing in Jesus' day. Well, number one, by intimidation. 
Number two, by interference. And then number three, by imprisonment. <coughs> by imprisonment. <coughs> Look at Acts chapter 4 and verse 3 and then Acts 5.18. So intimidation didn't work. Inter interference didn't work. Now we're going to imprison you. We'll just show you how powerful we really are. Acts 4.3 and they, the political powers that be, laid hands on them and put them in hold unto the next day, for it was now eventide. We'll just take away your freedoms. We'll just incarcerate you. Isn't it interesting that in California they're emptying all of our prisons because they're overpopulated, and in San Francisco the powers that be have taken that which used to be Oh, I forgot the word. What's higher than mm, a federal crime? What's that called? Ah, oh, rats. My mind just went blank. Felonies. They have taken that which is a felony, and now they've made them misdemeanors. And so now the police in San Francisco, when they have problems with theft and robbery because the 10,000, about 10,000 homeless people that live there, they don't even answer the call. Because the powers that be took the teeth of the law away, so the police have no power over it, and so they just have to let it go. And then the powers of be say something like this. Since I have been in power, felonies have dropped. Duh! Nothing's a felony anymore! Oh, the foolishness of leaders that deny God's power. So, chapter 4, verse 30, they put their hands upon him, they put him in prison or into hold until the next day. Chapter 5, verse number 18, it says, And they laid hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. <laughs> you know what's amazing? The political powers imprisoned Peter and Paul, but the power in the heavenlies had the key. <laughs> he says, That old angel of God, go down there. Hey, here's the key. Can you go stick it in that lock? Tell Peter... And tell John to get back to work and get off that little hard mat and quit sleeping and get back to preaching. And they go to the prison the next day and everything's secure except they're not there. All the guards are where they're supposed to be, but Peter and John, they're just not there. <laughs> they try to imprison them. That doesn't mean God opens the door for every Christian that's imprisoned. But I'd much rather see the heavenly gates and that door opened up rather than just prison doors. And so we see the threats today that there's the threats of imprisonment. People have been fined, people have been threatened, people have been taken to the judges. But remember, the outcome is always that all men glorify God. What an opportunity. And then lastly, in chapter 5 and verse number 33, the other three didn't work, so now they're going to threaten them by personal injury, by injury. So number one, they threaten by intimidation. Number two, by interference. Number three, by imprisonment. And number four, by personal injury. Acts 5, verse number 33. Now here's Peter and John. They're just going to keep preaching no matter what. And as Peter and John speak to the authorities that be, here's how they answer in verse 33 of Acts 5. When they heard that, they were cut to the heart and took counsel to slay them. Cut to the heart, what does that mean? They're under conviction. They know they're guilty. But to assuage the guilt of their heart, we're going to kill you. <laughs> we're going to silence you. If intimidation didn't work, if interference didn't work, if imprisonment doesn't work, then we're going to injure you. We are going to slay you. Acts 5, verse 40. And to him they agreed. And when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus, and they let them go personal injury they wanted to kill him but the law wouldn't allow it so instead they beat them severely 
And yet what happened is they go their way rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer in the name of Jesus Christ. And then in closing, in application, how do we apply all this? World powers will always deem the church as irrelevant. Ir irrelevant. That's not a problem. That's a position of power and strength. Jesus has told us that the gates of hell will never prevail against the church. Meaning they're going to try to prevail against the church. It doesn't mean they're not trying to. It's just that it's not going to work. When a godly country begins to turn its back upon God and upon the Lord and upon Scripture, here's what Scripture tells us will happen when a godly nation turns away from God. I want you to see this. Proverbs 28, verse number 2. We are living in a time when our political elected powers aren't the ones that are deciding the course of how we're going to live our life today. It's medical doctors. It's bureaucrats. It's not the people that we've elected. I want you to notice Proverbs 28, 2. Why does that happen? Because when the sins of a country are many, bureaucracy is going to go through the roof. That is where we're at right now. And close with this verse, Proverbs 28 and verse number 2. For the transgression, or the sin, for the transgression of a land, notice what happens, many are the princes thereof. Princes are underlings, aren't they? They're not the ones in power. They are appointed to power. American, we would say that our bureaucracies are the ones that are making all of the decisions. Is that not where we're at today? Go try to build something in California and find out how much bureaucracy will keep you from doing it. Why does that happen? Because Christians have counted themselves and the church is not essential. That's the problem. The problem doesn't lie with our government saying that the church is non-essential. The greatest problem with our country today is not the attacks of the left. That only causes the church to grow. It's not the liberal media. It's not the politicians. The church's greatest growth was during that cruel period of time under emperors of Rome. The greatest problem is that even when the church was open, many Christians just stayed home. That's the problem. Well, you know, Pastor, we would be there, but you know it was such a great day. Just We went fishing and just enjoyed the lake, and we worshiped God out there on a lake. No, if you were worshiping God in a lake in a boat, he would have sunk your boat. <laughs> it's a command to be in the house of God. It's never a suggestion. It's American Christianity that has deemed the church as non-essential, and therefore the church has lost its influence because we gave it up. American Christianity that says it's not necessary. It's, it's not indispensable. It's not practical. It takes away from my free time. When that happens, the princes are many. Bureaucracy rises and rises and rises and rises and rises, and the politicians of the day cannot control the agencies that they've created. Why? Because of the transgressions of a land. But if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will heal their land. Church is essential. Child of God, those that are listening, has church been essential in your family's life? The minute you allow something else to become more important than the house of God that Jesus Christ died for, that Jesus Christ said, do not turn away from the church. The minute something else turns you from that, that becomes your God. Because that's now what you put above the commands of Jesus Christ. Now that doesn't mean sometimes emergencies don't come up or things come up or you're away and you can't make it. Lord, Lord understands that. We're talking, well, I know I should be in church today, but we're turning a bunch of billy goats, butting our head against the word of God. The church is essential. The only way 
that Christians will take control of the, ca- the country once again is not through the political powers, although that's a great help and a great blessing. What's going to help is when God's people start living like the church is essential. I'm so thankful for mom and a dad that woke me up, drug my lazy carcass out of the bed and said, get dressed, we're going to church. Oh, no, shut up and get dressed. But, 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 not going to work. I'm glad I was taught that. And I'm glad that our family also was taught that. There is nothing that is more essential than being in the house of God. And it doesn't matter what day of the week, if those doors are open, you're going to be the first ones going through those doors because it's essential. Nothing takes the place. And so if we're going to cry because the church is not essential, judgment first has to begin at the house of God. And if it begins there, how it's going to impact the rest of the world. Let's live our life with the church being the most essential point of life. If you raise your family in a loving kindness of the scripture and with that attitude, I guarantee you when they grow up, they'll not depart from those ways or you'll find them coming back eventually. Is it essential? Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father in heaven, we bow before your presence. Lord, I know that in my own mind it has been in an uproar. My soul has been troubled. Lord, as we listen to all the liberal media, the lies, the hypocrisy, Lord, the, some politicians that are just interested in power and deny the authority of God's word over their life or over the states that they govern. Lord, that is a small part of the problem. But the real problem is, is so many Christians in America are saying the same thing that the godless party in America is saying. Church is not essential. It's a good place to be. And if I have time, I'll be there. And, you know, if I have time, I might even get involved and proclaim the name of Christ. Therein lies the problem. With Christianity, not with the world powers but with us. Lord God, would you convict us if we need conviction? Would you stir our hearts, Lord, to love the church the way that Jesus loved, for, loved it and died for it? And that we're not to forsake the gathering of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Lord, revive your people's hearts. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We have a video for Memorial Day that we're going to watch and enjoy. They are more than just names. More than blocks of stone set in rows. More than memories. They are our brothers and sisters, our parents and our children. Friends, loved ones, and even strangers who believe that we were worth fighting for, that we were worth dying for. They stand for justice, for courage, for heroism, and fearlessness in the face of danger. They stand for the brave men and women who selflessly answered the call and gave their very lives for the cause of freedom. Let us never take their sacrifice for granted, but instead remember with gratitude those who have served. Today, tomorrow, and every day thereafter. By the grace of God, if we walk upon free soil, if we breathe in the sweetness of liberty, let us give thanks, let us honor the fallen, and let us 
never forget.